Now then, Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court, Honorable Judges of the High Court, lawyers, students, employees, ladies and gentlemen. You know, this, this, this form of address when one ends with ladies and gentlemen, it's really quite silly because it means that the ones who I've already addressed are not ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit illogical, but nevertheless, uh, you know what I mean. Uh, uh, with the permission of the Chair, I would like to start today's talk with a reference to Mr. Dipankar P. Gupta, ex Solicitor General of India and Chamber Senior of my husband, Shamaradit Tapal, Senior Advocate, and myself. Mr. Gupta passed away on 3rd of March 2019, five days ago. He was, apart from being a brilliant and analytical lawyer, extremely ethical. Whatever ethical values I had in the profession were imbibed from him, not through a lecture, but by his conduct in the profession. His first love, however, was not law but physics. This accounted for his orderliness in habit and arguments. More relevant to today's topic, was his in initial attitude to me when I joined his chamber. He was basically a traditionalist and did not look up at me at all, as I dutifully and hopefully sat at his table for about three months. I confronted him soon enough, much to the horror of his only junior, then, subsequently my husband, I said I have to earn a living. That shook him. And ever since that day, he was careful to see that I was briefed in a few cases as his junior and even loaned me money so that I could get married to his first junior. <laughs> we built our house in Kolkata close to his because it would be convenient, you know, attending chambers. But he left soon afterwards for Delhi to take up the post of Solicitor General. Although he was inducted during the Congress regime, he was absolutely apolitical and would, after demitting office, happily appear against the government. We lost touch more so when I came to Delhi to join the Supreme Court. He never appeared before me. Today is otherwise a special day for me for several reasons. For one, I am a woman and the day is dedicated internationally to all women. And second, the birthday of my personal teacher is being celebrated today according to the Bengali calendar. I was asked to speak at the behest of Justice Malhotra. I don't know if I really need this. It's working sometimes and sometimes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. You can switch this off. Uh, on behalf of the GSICC. Now this generation, the generation after me, or uh, maybe two generations after me, this generation speaks in acronyms. And I had no idea what this particular acronym denoted when she invited me. I accepted the invitation because of the topic and because of Justice Malhotra. Why Justice Malhotra? Apart from my affection for her at a personal level, I respected her rationality as an advocate and now respect her as a judge because she ex exemplifies what, in my opinion, a woman should be, both as a lawyer and as a judge. <laughs> to inform myself as to what the acronym GSICC stands for, I googled it <laughs> and found that it was a committee set up by the Supreme Court to deal with sexual harassment in the Supreme Court. The efforts to curb sexual harassment of women in courts started with an incident which occurred in the Delhi High Court. As reported in the newspaper, a male employee of the High Court had been filming lady advocates in the toilet. 
The incident was drawn to the attention of the Supreme Court by a lawyer, and I am told by two lawyers because the court cited only mentions one, Binu uh, Tamta, with a prayer for the framing of appropriate regulations to deal with the menace of sexual harassment of women in courts. To stop, as said by the Supreme Court, sexual predation, I'm quoting, in the court precincts. Regulations were approved, which are now called, now this is where the full name comes in, the Gender Sensitization and Sexual Harassment of Women at the Supreme Court of India within brackets, Prevention, Prohibition and Regulation, oh sorry, Regulations 213, that was the regulation. A committee was set up now called the Gender Sensitization and Internal Complaints Committee. This is the GSICC. Two, and again I quote <clears throat> from the Supreme Court <clears throat> to address some of the genuine apprehensions that women practitioners and employees of this court and other courts have with regard to the invasion of their privacy. Other courts, it's important. And that is why uh, Justice Manotra said that it is important that uh, it is circulated to all the uh, other courts. I will limit myself today to the last phrase, namely, invasion of privacy. The beginning of women's awareness in India that they are entitled as a matter of law to protection from sexual harassment began with the case of gang rape generally known as Justice Malhotra has already told you as the Vishakha rape case. Incidentally, the victim's name was not Vishakha. Vishakha was one of the two main disciples of Gautam Buddha, known for her wisdom and generosity. The name of the victim was in fact Bhavari Devi and she was a social worker fighting against child marriages in a village in Rajasthan. The matter was brought before the Supreme Court by a women's activist group called Sakshi. I was hoping that the representative of Sakshi would be here, but she's not. I will refer to Sakshi later on again. But to return to Vishakha, drawing on international covenants and the government of India's repeated acceptance of those covenants internationally. In 1997, the Supreme Court laid down what are now known as the Vishakha Guidelines, which are the objective criteria to protect women from being sexually harassed in the workplace. However, it took more than 20 years for the central government to enact, to enact the sexual harassment of women at the work, Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act in 2013. Therefore, from rape to being spied upon, what is being protected by the law relating to sexual harassment is ultimately a woman's privacy. The word woman is used by me generically. This implies objective criteria based on reason, rather than subjective emotion to determine the ambit of her privacy. In my opinion, the word privacy means the space recognized in law relating to the identity of an individual, male or female, which cannot be assailed or infringed except with that individual's consent, express or implied. As to what, again in my opinion, constitutes a woman's identity will be clear from what I say today. In fact, I hope this is an answer to Ms. Narayanan's question, who am I? Uh, the 2013 Act is important because it forces women to turn inward as it were and understand how we as women define this space 
Once we have determined this for ourselves, it will be easier to decide how to behave in the different roles a woman is called upon or chooses to play in her life. It's a matter of her choice. Today I have been asked to speak on women in the law. I assume the phrase does not mean how the law treats women, but refers to women who have either chosen law as a subject for research or as a career as practitioners or are in some way associated with the implementation of the law in courts.